Now on the Amped Up to 11 podcast, Sam Schaefer. Sam underwent an elective amputation as a result of a nine-year fight with complex regional pain syndrome. Sam's decade of experience and personal training led to discovering and unlocking his largest potential as an amputee. Sam is now the founder of Schaefer Adaptive Methods, specializing in working with others to improve and develop self-help tools for their entire life to create progress. Sam is quickly becoming a social media influencer within the fitness and amputee community and continues to inspire all of his followers. It is our pleasure to welcome to the show, Mr. Sam Schaefer. There he is, Sam Schaefer in the house. How are you? I am doing great. I'm really excited, really excited to be on here. Oh, I I appreciate you in more ways than one. We just met recently, me and Sam. Although I feel like we're old friends, it was such a pleasure to meet you at the conference, the Ampu- Amputee Coalition uh, Conference. And now here you are in, on the Amped Up to 11 podcast and sharing your story and your particular brand of amputee lifestyle. And... You know, I think the thing that drew me to you initially in meeting you was just how offering you were of yourself, your energy, and having this genuine excitement about sharing so much of what you've experienced, not only as someone who has been training for a long time, is is somewhat sort of immersed in, in fitness and good health, but now that you're an amputee, you are sort of churning that into something that can be offered to the entire community. And we need people like you, Sam. We need people that can provide a beacon to follow, someone that can provide hope and inspiration, and not only talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. And I follow you as I'm sure you're aware. I'm sure you're, you're aware of your followers. And I, I, I'm just blown away by your message and what you're doing, not only for amputees, but just people in general. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about your story and I would like you to start today by providing the listeners with something that, a definition, let's say, of something that you struggled with for a long time. Complex pain syndrome, something that I don't know a whole lot about. And this is something that was very much a part of your life. So I want to kick off the interview that way. I want you to explain to the audience what that is and how it affected your life. Yeah. Um, so you're not alone. Um, in fact, most of the times I was in the office with the doctor for my complex regional pain syndrome, I knew more than they did. Uh, the name is pretty indicative of how well we understand it. It's super nondescript and it's a, well, to undersell it, it's a major bummer. Um, so complex regional pain syndrome is a, it's a nerve, it's a nerve disorder where basically I had, I was getting pain signals sent constantly that shouldn't have been sent. Um, so I, I dealt with this for nine years, uh, almost exactly. Uh, my injury occurred September 6, 2011. My amputation occurred August 26 of 2020. So literally almost to the day, nine years, um, in that time, I didn't have a single second out of pain and everyone, everybody gets complex regional pain syndrome, a little different or CRPS. I'll going to use the shorthand. I'm going to get really tired of saying it. You're going to get really tired of hearing me say it. Yeah. Um, so some people get really touch sensitive. I I'm really fortunate that did not happen to me. Like I, there are people that literally, they cannot handle the, the sensation of a blanket on their affected limb. I was extremely fortunate that that was not my case. 
my big shining star is that I couldn't turn it off. There was never a zero on the pain chart for the day it happened. Um, it was constant. It messes with your sleep. It puts you in a sympathetic nervous state pretty well constantly, which um, if you're not familiar with what that means, it's basically your fight or flight. So me trying to go to sleep, I can't even get out of a fight or flight state. The, the quality of sleep that happens, if it even happens, is very poor. And then what ha comes from there, just to kind of more be on the experience side, is it just continues to compound and compound and compound. And it beats you down. And uh, to paint with a light brush, uh, people don't die from this condition. They don't die from natural causes, unfortunately. This is, but it's very hard to treat. Um, some people, they, they get some sort of relief. Uh, I was treatment resistant. So for all the different medications I tried, for all the different injections into my spine, into my leg, nothing really did anything for me to help. And, nothing, and the only thing that I was able to turn to was making sure that my machine was operating as well as it could even though it couldn't operate very well, I still had to be very focused on what is a hundred percent of that. And yeah, so like I said, everyone's CRPS is probably a little bit different. Um, the only other real good detail I can give you is that there is an actual pain chart out there. And this is the only thing that's rated higher than natural childbirth. Wow. And as far as, if there is a level of management of that, because people that deal with chronic pain, which comes in many varieties, forms, they'll always talk about pain management. <clears throat> is there anything in the spectrum of whether that's medication, whether that's particular PT, was there anything in the realm of treatment that could give you some kind of relief at any point? Um, it really came down to, I couldn't lower the pain. I had to figure out how to deal with it, mm. how to sit with it. Um, so a lot of it was perspective. A lot of it was introspective. Um, uh, that's where I picked up meditation, breath work. Um, I, I'm one of your guys that likes to hop in a bucket of ice. Th those sorts of things became management strategies for me. Mm -hmm. Cannabis came into play later, in, late in the game as a management strategy. Again, it didn't really lower my pain, but it allowed me to be accepting that this is what was happening. And it became, again, it, it became a very useful tool for me to be able to turn the volume down a little bit. Uh, to get that little bit of space. Like I said, that's where all the breath work came into. It was very holistic. Yeah. Um, it was very much like very aggressively on what I could control. And then from a function standpoint, it was my training. So I kept losing function or the pain, you know, there's different bits of function just kept, you know, falling off over the course of the nine years. So like I started off training one way and then coming, like coming off of a pull-up bar became an issue. So like, Jumping up and down on a pull-up bar was a problem. Sustained effort became a problem. I couldn't do endurance type stuff. Um, so I really had to lean into strength. So I had to be as strong as possible because I was only going to be able to express so much of it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I found that there was a big difference in my ability to move around when my squat was above or under 400 pounds. Interesting. Yeah. And like I said, I don't think that was a super medicinal thing. But like it was a function, but it was a function thing where like I had to have so much capability because at any point like it could fall off and like yeah. it could just my left leg could just stop. And that did happen multiple times training and we had to adjust the training style. And again, I had to continue to learn and evolve. My understanding had continued to have to raise. And um, while it was really challenging at the time and all those lessons were really hard fought, it did come into play later, fortunately for me. Yeah. You know, I, I had taken some notes cause you know, I do show prep on everybody and I had, I had wrote down some things. I, I had recently, I was <clears throat> listening to an, a, uh, I, I believe it was a Ted talk and someone was, was talking about, uh, individuals who reach 
their fullest potential. And I'm not talking about financial. I'm not even talking about, you know, spiritual necessar- necessarily, but just whatever their fullest potential is, what is the determining factor that provides someone the ability to reach their fullest potential? And they were talking to teachers, they were talking to professional people. So they had this whole spectrum, you know, business owners, entrepreneurial people, uh, doctors, all kinds of people. And what they found is that it had nothing to do with IQ. It had nothing to do with your physical self, meaning your, let's, let's call it your genetics, you know? Um, it all boiled down to one word, grit. All of them agreed that people reach their fullest potential when they have grit. And I thought, shit, that's, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty intense, right? So I got curious and I said, okay, what is the what's the de- what's the definition of grit and i looked it up and it said firmness of mind or spirit unyielding courage in the face of hardship or danger and i only explored that because of you and your story and thinking all right this guy's in pain <laughs> He's in pain for nine fucking years. Like, how, how does he, you know, what what is it that helps him transcend? You know, what 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 keeps pushing him? What keeps programming him on a daily basis? And I just kept revisiting that TED talk, and I'm like, it, it's got to, it's just got to be as simple as that. He just has the grit, the unyielding, you know, desire to just keep going, keep going. And and as humans, right, we all have that ability, that sort of survival instinct. Very rarely do any of us go quietly, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, you've been through a lot. I mean, you've been through a lot. And for you to come out on the other side of that and to be doing the things that you're doing now is a huge source of inspiration, again, for not only amputees, but just the general population to see how you can turn all of that around and and to be living your best life again. Um, how, if someone were to ask you that question, you know, Sam, you know, how did, how did you get through those nine years? I mean, what, what would you say? Grit. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not joking. That was actually, if you would have asked me to answer before you gave all that, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, grit by Angela Duckworth is one of the most important books I've ever read. There you go. Um, so if that is an interesting topic, I could not recommend that book well enough. Yeah. It's a wildly cool objective view of the, of this very subjective idea that gets tossed around. Right. And uh, for me, my grit came from like, deciding that it was a choice. Like again, CRPS is called the suicide disease. I had to choose to be here. The, 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 the way out was obvious. Yeah. Like, like the reality is, is after everything's failed, well, how do you get out of pain? You end it. Yeah. I, I had that choice, you know? And so it came down to me. I like, I had to choose every day. I want to be here. Yeah. And sometimes it would, I had to choose every hour. I want to be here. I'm here because I want to be here. I knew I was going to be in pain. I, I knew, I knew this, I knew the conditions. This isn't new. I'm making that choice. And I had to lean into the fact that I at least had that power over this. Yeah. And I was going to make the choice to do my best and then make the choice to be here or don't like, mm-hmm. but don't make like, for me, like one of my greatest fears is like the second best version of myself. Like from like a purgatory standpoint, like I can't think of a greater purgatory than than like having to meet the version of myself I could have been. Mm. That's terrifying to me. I want to be that guy. 
And that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty evolved. No, no offense, pretty evolved for a young guy. You know what? I had some, I, I had to put on some hard miles early on. Um, yeah. Like I got stripped down. I got stripped down bare be, wait, wait, before I was 25. Yeah. Like I was down to the bone. And like I said, I, I had to make the choices and um, I'm grateful that I did. Yeah. And, you know, talking a little bit more about your amputation, which, which, uh, I, I'm, I'm under the impression that this, this was somewhat elective, correct? I was, yeah, it was elective. Um, okay. I got fought on it. I got told no. Okay. So kind of walk me through what, what led up to that decision. And aside from the obvious, which is <laughs> I'd been in pain for nine years. It hurts a lot. Yeah. Like what, like, um, like what was like the decision point? Yeah. So there's always that tipping point because I, I have met amputees that, you know, elect, you know, for this, this particular, uh, this choice, this hard choice. Um, I, I was just, uh, recently talking to, to a guy named Jamie Gain, who, uh, is pretty active in the amputee community. And he, 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 he had a similar condition, um, but uh, fought really, really hard to to have his amputation. And you know now now he's you know he's got all kinds of endorsements, and you know he he's one of those those big sort of shooting stars in the amputee community. What was that process like for you, and what was that pushback like for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, this, you're going to hop right into the darkest part of the story, huh? <laughs> um, I, I mean, that's, it's, it's where it all comes from. Um, I was at my end, um, uh, to be completely honest, I was, I didn't have, I'm a very object, like objective thinking is what saved me. And I had gotten to the point that I, there was no evaluation that I could do. I'm not even 30. And I cannot figure out like, this can't be life. And even worse, this can't be my wife's life. She is too special to spend her life taking care of me like this. And at the time, it, be, it was a lot of guilt. I felt really guilty about what I was doing to her. Mm -hmm. And like, and that was, that became really a war on me. It was nothing that she ever said and she never felt it was all my own, it was all my own BS that I had to de deal with and sort out. And I almost became a statistic one night. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, I, I, yes, I, I was at the point where I was ready to end my life. Um, the night that I almost did, I, I, by time that the sun came back up, I was like, no, I was like, this has to go. I have one punch left to throw it's time to go. Um, this is late December of 2019. I called, I, I'm a, I'm a military veteran. Uh, so I called the VA requ request an appointment with my, uh, primary care physician. They give me a phone interview or they give me a phone call instead of an appointment. And I tell her like, and the reality is, is the VA had not really helped me. Um, Really early on, I'd been out. I hadn't been out for very long, and so they tried to offer me like, "Well, okay, so you you just want a recurring prescription of Vicodin?" And I said, "No." I was like, "That's not a good idea." I was like, "We know how that story goes. That's not a solution, and we don't have a we don't have a uh, an end in sight. This is not. It's not a safe solution." Uh, though I'll never forget the the nurse. I don't even really much. I just remember she's female looks me dead in the eye and goes, oh, it must not be that bad then. They didn't give me any help after that. Um, so I didn't, so being tired, angry, in pain, I just kind of said, fuck it. And I didn't do anything with the VA for a long time. Um, they, they had me rated at a 0% uh, disability on it as well for six years mm. after. And so I called and I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. I'd like, I'd like a surgery consultation for an amputation. And she t tries to tell me, no, that that's, that that's an extreme measure. 
And I was like, you're not the one living with this. I understand that. But your job is to give me this. After a little bit more back and forth, she finally puts one in. It takes way too long to get, but I, I, I get it. Um, later in January, I believe. And the surgeon walks in, says, hi, I'm Dr. Zakari, and starts pointing fingers in my face and says, you will fail because of this. And it's like listing off reasons that he's certain that I'll fail for surgery. And then says, I've never, in the nine years, I've never even tried to get better. At no point did he ask me what's going on, how it's going or anything. That was my surgery consult. Mm. Was was this guy telling me I'm going to fail, forces me into uh, a few treatments that I had already failed that had he, had he looked at my records, he would have seen that, that actually made things a lot worse from a function standpoint. And then, so I do all these things and that I got told, well, if you do these things, we'll give you another consult to speak to another surgeon. She stops returning my phone calls. Um, and then COVID comes in, comes into the equation and then she starts using that, that starts getting used as an excuse. And like to, but like excuse to not call me back. Like th there's like, there's just a bunch of, there was a lot of things that were done incorrectly. And we got near August, close to August and had gotten to the point that like I had fought and fought and fought and fought. And like I said, cause I knew that this is, I, I have to have this if my life is going to continue. Like I'm fighting for my life yeah. and they're fighting to not have to do paperwork. Um, because they're a little uncomfortable with the request. Like the the patient advocate wouldn't even help me. Because you're like, you got to understand this is all, this is an uncomfortable thing for her. I was like, imagine how I'm feeling if I'm requesting this. Yeah. And like, yeah, like there was a whole lot of things that were misconduct. And I basically ended up having to put together this like four page timeline proving that they are acting inappropriately that they're working that basically that I was being, they were working against me. And I was like, I would like my consultation out of the VA system. Like I'm supposed to be afforded under the community cares act. If this is not going to happen, I'm sure there's local news stations that would love to talk, love to talk to me about this. Hey everybody. Today I want to talk about the Ross. The Ross is a liner cleaning system that I really feel compelled to talk about with our listeners. As most of you know that follow the podcast, I really don't do a whole lot of product endorsing, but I, I really feel that I want to get this out into the community. We all, as amputees, tend to struggle with cleaning liners, cleaning our gel liners. Whether you're below the knee or above the knee, we have these gel liners that have to stay clean. We don't want to develop skin infections, things of that nature. And having a fresh, clean liner seems to be one of the most important aspects of daily management of an amputee. And I was introduced to the Ross system through the company. And basically, this device is something where you can put your liner into this sort of tube, let's call it, and within 10 minutes, or if you want a deeper clean, within 20 minutes, you get a fresh, clean liner. And I am just ecstatic about this. It provides me the ability to have clean liners all the time. I never have to put a liner in the tub, in the sink. I never really have to use soap and water again. And it's really been just a wonderful product and experience in terms of what is available to amputees. So I want everyone to check out the Ross. It's a great system. Check it out, here it is. The ozone generated by Ross eliminates germs and odor causing bacteria that soap and water alone cannot, leaving prosthetic liners smelling fresh, sanitized, and ready to wear in as little as 10 minutes. Independent laboratory tested, the device rapidly eliminates 99.9% .9 of bacteria that causes skin and soft tissue infections. The Ross sanitation process is compatible with all liner types, makes, and sizes. As a clinical grade device for home use, 
Ross is convenient and easy to operate at the point of care, in a clinic, or at home while one sleeps, eats, or watches TV. Check out the Ross today. Love to talk, love to, talk to me about this. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that it has to come to that because I, like, this is not. Yeah, we're like nine months into the fight. Yeah, this is not an uncommon theme. This is not something that I'm hearing for the first time. And, you know, the, these are the lifelines that people like yourself are reaching out for. And to get that kind of pushback <clears throat> is not helpful. And once you had the surgery, um, how long before you realized it worked? Immediately. Yeah. I was high as a kite. Yeah. But immediately. Yeah. I, I, I woke up. So that was actually my first surgery. Like that was the first surgery of my life. Um, was a nine hour amputation <laughs> surgery. Yeah. And uh, like, I don't even remember getting the first said. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, right. So I just all of a sudden. We call that baptism by fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's my, go. My, my, fir <laughs> my, my first flight was my first flight was to basic training. I think my next one was the airborne school. And the next plane I, I got in, I jumped out of. Wow. But like by, by the time that I got on a plane to leave airborne school, I had jumped out of more than I'd landed. Wow. It's just, you know, my life experience, <laughs> I didn't fly. I, I had never flown before. And um, it was, it was insane to be honest. Like my brain didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, like I just, yeah. Like I just remember like my surgeon handed me the phone. It was my, uh, so I could talk to my wife. And again, I am still not off the drugs. And I don't, I said something completely off the wall, goofy. And I was like, just like, it worked. I don't know what to, like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. My brain doesn't know what to do. Yeah. My wife and I, for the, like the next couple of months, we called it pinging where my brain would just find this space that it hadn't gotten to use for the, for the last 10 years. Yeah. And I was just all over the place. Like couldn't keep my, couldn't keep us sitting straight. Cause it was just like, I got all this room to go do karate now. <laughs> and you know, I'm all over the place. You know, I, you know, some huge, big emotional releases cried a bunch of times really hard, you know, there, cause there was also the relief of the guilt that I felt that of what I was doing to her life. And again, she never felt any of that, but I did. And, and I knew. Yeah. And you're, and you're obviously a testament to a very, very strong relationship. And I, I would think that, celebrating that moment was such a victory, not only for you, but for both of you. And to say, you know, I'm, I'm pain-free, let's get on to the next steps. What, what, what are we going to do now with this completely cleansed version of me? Because yeah, I, I didn't know who I was. Well, well, sure, because, you know, I always compare it to any other chronic illness where... You're living your life, but there is this constant static, there is this constant white noise in your life that basically prohibits you from fully experiencing what life has to offer. And, you know, I, I was in uh, dialysis for 18 months, and it was probably the roughest 18 months of my life where... I was here, but I wasn't really here. I, I felt as if I was a spectator of life. I was sitting on the sidelines, not really here. And I can identify with that. Yeah, I, I would think suddenly waking up to no pain or, or yeah, let's. I mean, that was, that, yeah, that was a third of my life at that point. Yeah. That was, yeah, and le and let's I, I and let's 30. say let's say you're you're you've got your post op pain, which which I'm sure for for Sam Schaefer you're like, ha, cool. ha, I was like, I was like, this is great. <laughs> you're like you're like ha ha ha. This is pain. <laughs> it, you know what? Like it really was. Like, uh, it was like yeah, I'll take this. Yeah, this feels this feels real. You're, like like the RPS <laughs> stuff. Like it it wasn't even real. After like, it was after confusing. everything you had been through. 
Y- y- your brain's like, yeah, this kind of feels like a paper cut to me. <laughs> I know yeah, for like some was... people, this is probably really hard, but for me, no, this is actually not so bad. Um, was, instead of choosing to be here, I was happy to be here. Yeah, exactly. And it would seem to me that you you have acclimated rapidly to a prosthesis, rapidly. And, you know, I, I, I mean, again, I, I follow you. I, I, I see what you're engaging physically. And what would you what would you say if there was a challenge in acclimation, adaptation, getting into a prosthesis and test driving that, seeing what that can do, and, and now where you're at, you know, as an amputee, explain to me what that process was like for you. I mean, in terms of oh yeah, I expected this or wow, this, this, this wasn't something I expected. Um, it was hard. Um, I, I think a lot of people mistake what they perceive as speed, uh, for ease. Um, I, I thought it was hard. Um, I did not, th- I didn't walk in and just start running around. Yeah. But what I had done is I had built up the skill to get good intentional reps and I knew how to practice. I knew how to practice what I was doing. Yep. So while, while one person saw speed, I was like, no, I'm just accumulating my reps faster because like, I'm still, I still like walking around in Orlando. I am consciously thinking about how I'm walking. I'm still practicing that gate. I'm still building that and I'm still having light bulbs go off Yep. and I'm still figuring out better, a more efficient way to get it done. And that was my big gift. And my, is, was that I had built such a foundation of practice and skill development. And that's how I treated everything. I, I thought of everything as just, just building a skill, just building a skill, just building the next skill so that I can build the next skill. Um, you know, like, you know, I had a lot of chat, like so one of my bigger challenges with the prosthetic early on was I shrank so fast. I went, th- I went through seven sockets in my first 12 months, like right at the 12 month mark, I got my seventh socket, three of those sockets, got changed out at over 20 ply socks, a couple more over 14. That's incredible. So like I was, yeah, I was shrinking really fast. So it was a long time actually before I got really comfortable in one. Mm-hmm. But again, it was such an improvement on what I was dealing with. Yeah. So I was like, Hey, this thing works. Yeah. <laughs> Plain and simple. It works. Yeah. Um, so like, that was what I think my big adv- advantage was, was perspective is I saw it as a skill and not like, I, I don't see any clout or any like, there's no identity in deadlifting 500 pounds or in any of that sort of stuff. Right. And it's you, just an extrapolation of the skill. And I've seen, I've seen some pictures of you, uh, you know, uh, pre-amputation. And I mean, you're a super fit guy. And do you feel like some of your acclimation in terms of, your residual limb, you know, changing so quickly, you transitioning into uh, certain certain high function activities. Would you would you say that some some of your existing fitness level played a major role in that? Uh, definitely, um, it, it definitely because there's that base and like my body knows what. Again, my body knows knew what a 500 pound deadlift felt like. Yeah. Um, that sort of posterior chain strength translates to really good function if you train it well on a prosthetic. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I really had in place were the habits. I wasn't having, I didn't have to figure out my diet. I didn't have to figure out my hydration strategy. I didn't have to figure out how to get my hydration done. Um, for as poor as my sleep was, I still worked very hard to make it as good as it could be. Yeah. So now that I didn't have the pain in the way, I just, it, now all these like habits that I had that was like Sisyphus pushing the rock. Well, that rock's not there anymore. Yeah. And what happens when that resistance is gone, but those habits remain. Yeah. And now I, you I can, my foot on the gas. Yeah. And now you can, I was going to say, now you can thrive because exactly. all, all of that static we were talking about, all those things that were clouding your vision are suddenly gone. And it's like, you know, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way, right? Right, exactly. So so it's that that thing that those aha moments of okay, I get it now. That this is this is what it feels like. 
because using a prosthesis and doing high functioning, you know, tricky, challenging activities, I always feel as an amputee that I I'm retraining or rewiring my brain to understand what that feels like now in a mm -hmm. prosthesis versus how it felt when I had both of my legs. So for me, cycling is a big thing. And I would say for probably the first maybe two, two and a half years that I, I was getting, getting into and challenging myself more and more going further distances, um, on my bike, I still had this sort of, I guess I would call it, someone would say, well, what does it feel like to ride a bike? And I'd say, well, imagine, and you know, I'm, I'm, uh, my amputations on my right leg. Are you, I can't remember which leg you are. You're left. You're left. So I would say, imagine riding a bike and your right foot is asleep, right? Cause, cause, cause mm -hmm. you don't, you don't know where your where your foot is. <laughs> you, Correct. You 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 can't tell if you're touching the pedal or not, and and very often my my prosthetic foot would just slip right off, right, because I don't I don't have that circular gait down. I don't have that re that feeling of revolutions with my leg. You haven't you haven't learned how to how to find it yet. Exactly, and now, you know it's such a different experience because all of this new wiring has been created between my residual limb and my brain that tells me this is what it feels like in your residual limb when your prosthetic foot is on the pedal. This is how it feels when your foot's off the pedal. So all of those new muscle memories and all that sensory stuff, and I'm, I'm not a medical person, but I feel like once those connections start to become more natural, that's when the possibilities are endless. And that's when you get really excited and go, shit, man, I can do anything. Like there's, there's really nothing. There, there are no excuses anymore. I, I, I can't say, well, uh, well, I can't because I'm an amputee. It's like, no, no. You, you, you finally tapped into your learning process. Exactly. And that's what I think that I did early. And exactly. that's, that was kind of like the skills and gifts that I got. That was my return on choosing to be present with all the yep. pain instead of trying to get, instead of trying to disassociate from it. That's that was my gift yep. is I understood what all that stuff was supposed to feel like up in my hip because I was already losing feeling in my foot and losing function in my foot. Yeah. So like I was able, I knew how to figure out that from a sensation standpoint, um, something that's very different about my coaching that I don't see very often is I don't coach anything. I don't tell anyone what your lift looks like. I coach, I coach and cue on sensation. You should feel this, find it here, wiggle mm -hmm. until you get this sensation. That's when you know you're in position. Like I learned to walk by, uh, with on a trap bar deadlift. Um, oh, wow. just put up, put 135 pounds on. I had just gotten my prosthetic. I, I realized that what I was being, what was happening in physical therapy wasn't exactly what I believed to be the best practice for physical learning, which I had been doing as a profession for the last, at that point, seven or eight years. You know, as a coach, I work, I, I've always had a passion for the beginner because I was a very low baseline athlete. Like yeah. when I started high school, I was 4'11", 95 pounds. <laughs> When I signed That's up, that's so the funny military, to me. Looking at you now, I'm like, okay, right? oh, someone grew up, <laughs> <laughs> right? But like I said, so I'm like, I'm a low baseline athlete. Like the first time I deadlifted, I got stopped at 135 because I didn't understand how to brace my spine. I was 155 pounds, but I knew that I was. I, but I learned what I responded to. I'm a high responder, and so like. I've always had to kind of build all that stuff up before. Yeah. So I also, so, but as a result though, I've always been attached to that very day one version of myself. And that served me very well coaching general population people because, you know, yeah, it, it's really fun to work with a freak athlete. It is exciting. It's wild. There's an element of like, let's see what we can do here. But my true passion and what makes me feel it in my chest is like, that person that's not the superstar athlete that identifies as not being the superstar athlete and getting them 
to the same quality of movement. I don't care if you're, you're moving the same weights. Can we move at the same level of function? Yeah. And so, so because I was so tapped into that, that I got a big return on it. And it was, again, it was a huge gift. And so like, so as I'm doing this physical therapy, I'm like, this isn't how I would teach anyone to do anything. So I went to the, so I went to a trap bar deadlift because in your hips, a hinge, a hinge happens in your walking gait and a deadlift is a hinge. So on that deadlift, I got both feet together though. I've got a much more stable balance and it taught me what it felt like to push into my prosthetic. What does it feel like when I've actually loaded it? And then I could feel myself improve and improve and improve. So I would do a set of five and I'd walk around and I would, and I would basically superset light, light sets of five deadlifts until I got it better and better and better. Mm -hmm. Cause again, it was about how every, I, I didn't add weight until I stopped feeling improvement in my movement quality. And what that started to do again, because that pattern, and then on top of that, that primed those muscles. Like I got put, you know, they put the leg on me and they're like, all right, go walk. There was, when you start, when you, when you're brand new to a prosthetic one, you've probably been sitting on your butt for at least three months. Yep. You don't know anything. Sometimes you a don't couple, know. sometimes a couple years. Yeah. Right. And so like I was given nothing to warm up with. Like there was nothing to warm up my hamstrings, to get them firing, to get them turned on, get my quads going. There was none of that happening. So I was like, all right, well, I can do that with a deadlift. I, I know how to do this. So let's try something different. Let's let, apparently this is out of the box, but to me, it's perfectly logical. I, yeah. I've studied the box uh, because of all the different things I had to do with, uh, with the pain and CRPS and the function loss. And so like I started trap bar deadlifting. Again, I wasn't doing it for weight. I was doing it for quality and to learn sensation. And then I started translating that to single leg walking. And that was, th once I realized that that worked, all bets were off. Yeah. What do you, uh, Sam, what do you want to, uh, how do you want to be perceived? I mean, you're ramping up your followers on Instagram. You're, you're sort of building your own personal brand um, in your coaching and all of that. Wh what do you want to represent in the amputee community? Speak, speak to the community right now. a a passion for learning a, co a constant you know constant students that white white belt mentality um and just an endless pursuit of progress that's the only thing we're promised like i i'm was never going to go to the nba but if i continue to work <laughs> <laughs> right. But if I, you, know, you mean that 4'11, 95 pounds stat didn't tip you off that I might not go to the NBA. But the reality is, if I kept working and kept training, I could, could I would, I was not guaranteed the NBA, but I was, I would be guaranteed progress. Yeah. And now, and that's not just physical. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm learning that mentally. I'm learning that from like the business skill set stuff, like just running a one man business. Uh, or starting a one-man business, um, you know, I, I'm having to wear all these different hats and like, all right, I can't focus on what I can't do. I got to focus on what I can do and what I can turn that into yeah. next. Um, you know, like my, my wife and I are both learning to play disc golf right now. And one of the things I was talking to her about, like, because I understand the mechanics of it a lot because I do those, I do rotational sports uh, anyway with the you know, like Highland Games and I box and all that and kickbox and all that stuff. Um, but it's not the same. I was like, you learn, but you learn in steps. You don't learn in jumps. Yeah. You, you got to learn one step at a time. And if I can communicate that sort of a culture of progress and patience, I, I know that my impact will be overwhelmingly positive. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak to the audience and, and outline how do I get a hold of Sam? How does he, how, how does he prefer I reach out to him? Cause very often people will just take this into their own hands and you're like, whoa, 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 there's a way to do this. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to let you describe, this is how you get a hold of me. All right. The, the best way to get a hold of Sam Schaefer is to go to Instagram, put in my handle, Sam Schaefer one, S A M S C H A E F E R the number one, um, and just send me a message. 
shoot a co comment on a video, send me a message. I have gotten connected with some awesome people this way, just reaching out for help. And I can't think of a more rewarding way to use this time that I'm not supposed to get. I'm not supposed to be here. So I can't think of a better way than to try and smooth out your path by answering questions. Um, you know, I've had so many people come to me that are pursuing an elective amputation or trying to decide on an elective amputation. And for the record, if you send me that message, I'm not going to say do it or don't do it. I will, I will ask you that I will help you find the right questions, but no, I'm not going to make that decision for you. Right. Um, but as the more I evolve, the more tools and abilities that I'm creating and my ability to serve others and help others. So shoot me a message. Let's talk. Yeah. Um, Instagram's definitely the be best way to get a hold of me right now. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you clarifying that and making yourself available in, in, in such an open door kind of policy way. And the, the community needs people like yourself. You know, I, I, I sit back and I think, now I know Sam has a bad day or two. Yes. I know it's not all guts and glory, you know. So describe to me, you know, a bad day for you and, and how you recover from that. Um, a bad day for me is not really based on absolute what did or didn't happen. It's did I do what I could do? Like I, I have my, I have my daily minimums and I don't get to yeah. be upset if I miss my, if I don't miss my minimums, 7,000 steps. That's it. Like, did I wake up and do my breath work? Yeah. Uh, did, did, like, again, like I, I look at it more like that and like, so when, when I focus on these sorts of things, like I don't find myself getting frustrated again, I've got, I, I've lost enough time. I'm not going to waste time being upset about time. That's already gone. Um, yeah. but yeah, so, so that, that's it for me. Like that, that's what would make a bad day for me is I did not take care of what I could control. I can't control if it rains and storms outside. And that means I can't go out and do the track workout that I wanted to do or, if a storm takes my internet out and I don't get any phone service and I can't do the social media work I needed to do. <laughs> um, the things, that, the things that I really get myself on are results of bad planning. Yeah. Like, okay, that, okay. I can't get to that today. Well, I've got this project already lined up that like on my schedule, I try to put either three things for the week that this is how you fill your open time. Or each day I'll put a priority like, hey, on Monday in your free time, you're going to work on this program. Um, on Tuesday in your free time, you're going to work on LLC uh, business stuff. Okay, the website needs stuff in your free time on Wednesday. Like I, I have that sort of stuff. It's when I don't execute my own plans or I don't or I set myself up for failure by not having a plan. That's a bad day. Yeah. Now, in terms of prosthetics, I know the last time that we spoke at the conference, we we touched a little bit on uh, Levitate and some of the the blades that they're creating. Um, you you seem to have a, a pretty fresh perspective on where all of that is going. Uh, you know, how, how how are you feeling about them as a company? Let's say comparative to some of the bigger corporate structures. Um. I'd like to start with, uh, this is not a disparagement of any other company. Like I've got an Oser foot. I've got a couple, <laughs> I, I've got a couple Oser feet They're, They are great. Like they, they, they work very well. Um, this isn't a statement to their quality. Oh, we're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to shut down your endorsements. Don't worry. No, no, um, no, no. I didn't even mean it like that. It's just like, <laughs> I, I hate it when, whenever someone's like, oh, you like this. So, oh, see, so oh man, that's a negative on this. No. I believe no, that levitate. No, no, no. I believe that levitate are working for pro, for the prosthetic users. They're they are selling, they are selling and making products for me and for you. They're not making products for the insurance companies to sign off on. Yes, and there is a there is a marked difference in the culture that I've experienced in speaking to these different uh, companies. And like I said, levitate like it's not just because you know, two of the, you know, Laze and Sebastian are both amputees, but like it helps, but like they listen. And like, I've had like one of the things that they got told is like, Oh, you, Oh, you guys are the only ones that are listening to the end users 
everybody asked for a black foot shell and you guys are the only ones that are doing it. So like it's little things like that, that, that speak to the larger culture that they have going on, which is again, we're here for amputees. Yeah. We're not here for, for the insurance companies to how do we build the insurance companies? We're not setting prices to discount for the insurance companies. They're setting prices. So, cause they want, they flat out, all they care about is that people are using their products and getting a better quality of life. Yeah. And it's just been unreal to get to kind of, to learn about, to get to know those guys and to just, again, be, being new and like the reality is I'm a VA patient and I'm doing well, I have access to whatever I want. Right. Uh, I don't have an access issue, but I think it's a very real issue that I want to be a part of a solution for. Right. Because the way things are currently going is a little bit nonsense and completely unnecessary and overall more costly to the insurance companies, oddly enough. And again, they are, they, what they are doing is a part of the solution, both from, from all their structures from there, how do they, what do they charge? How do they sell? Who do they sell to? But like, again, how are they making the products? What sort of systems are they trying to create? I mean, their unleash system and their quick change system and setup is sick. Like it's yeah. unreal and it saves, it saves the user a ton of money. And all of us know that like, it's not the easiest thing to get a socket that fits great. They're setting you up to get that one socket that fits great and make it easy to attach anything else to it. And that's right. just so much better than like, you know, I've got, you know, a few other feet right now that have got extra sockets. And I'll tell you what, that's my wife's least, least favorite part of it all is like these sockets yeah. make these things take up so much extra space. And now I'm getting ready to use their quick change system. Uh, I believe it'll be in the mail. Like I th believe I'll have it by next week. And, uh, now all of a sudden my storage space goes down and it's that much easier. And I'm going to get more use out of my other stuff, even the stuff yep. that isn't levitate, you know? Um, you know, I, I love to, you know, I learned to skateboard after my amputation cause I wasn't allowed to growing up. I was like, ah, well, guess what I'm going to go do. And uh, I've got a, <laughs> I I've caught got a bio that. Foot. Yeah, no, I caught I, I've that, got a bio uh, foot for that. I caught that I'm gonna uh, clip of you on a skateboard and I thought, okay, this is, uh, this is getting serious now. This is getting real. And uh, I, it it's inspiring. I you know, like I don't have problems. I have I have things that need solutions, but I don't have any problems. And that that's how I view all that. Like the only limit is time. If I'm willing to use the time, I'll figure it out. And I'll probably try to then help others figure it out too, because skateboarding's cool. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. And well, <clears throat> go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah. And like, and like the, th a, a thought process for me on like all these like more challenging things that I've attacked, attacked and like, oh, well, that's not a good act activity for an amputee. Well, well, none of them are none of them. No, no, nothing is meant to only have one foot and then a fake one. Yeah. Think about what else is on the table. If you can figure that thing out. Oh, for sure. For sure. And you know, there's there's definitely a need for people like yourself in this community, and obviously, the next year or two is is going to probably feel like a bit of a whirlwind for you, because so so many of us look to people like yourself for inspiration and motivation, and seeing someone producing the kind of content that you do that gives us some 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 semblance of what the possibilities really are and i always say you know don't necessarily see those things as your goal um that's just rocket fuel for you to reach your personal fullest potential so my, my athletics are r and d yes Plain yes. and simple. I am 10 times the coach as I am an athlete. And that's been me for a long time. No, I, I, I get it. And, you know, I kudos uh, big time. I so appreciate you engaging and diving into this thing head first into the deep end of the pool, so to speak. And I, I, I wish nothing but the best for you. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point we can circle back 
and uh, revisit again. I, I know we're oh, going to yeah. bump into each other uh, a whole lot more as, as we both, you know, go on this journey in, in, with this community. Um, but again, uh, that's going to wrap it up for us. Sam Schaefer, thank you so much for your time. And I, I so appreciate you being here and sharing all of this, uh, you know, all of this incredible information. And, um, you know, is there anything you want to say to the community in closing? I just want to help. That's awesome. Plain and simple. Plain yeah. and simple. That and part two of this interview is going to be wild. <laughs> That's for sure. Sam Schaefer, thank you. I am Rick Bonkowski. This is the Amped Up to 11 podcast. I want to wish everyone health and happiness, and we will see you next time.